thank you all for, for coming to this uh, a rather different lecture. He told a lot of great anecdotes about his career in science. Well, I was surprised at um, how early he became inspired. I had a toy microscope and there was a creek near my home where one day I went and collected a jar of pond scum and I came back and I put a drop of this on a glass slide under this microscope and uh, I was captivated from that moment to see the microbial world emerge even from this plastic lens. I was surprised at how early that um, scientific spark kind of came. When you're a student and you're in the trenches of schoolwork and you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life, it's nice to know that the people who are making improvements in our world were once normal students like us. I vowed to save money uh, to buy myself a student professional microscope and I was slowly building up to my goal of $100, putting it in an envelope in the closet in my bedroom, when I found that my mother kept borrowing the money to buy groceries. And one Saturday, I was so angry that I bicycled to the police station and I told the duty officer that I was running away from home because my mother was stealing my money and I couldn't get my microscope. Well, this event, you can get a lot out of it. Being a Nobel laureate, obviously, they've going through the path, the bumps and bruises. But I learned a valuable lesson that afternoon because we uh, drove right from the police station to a pawn shop where for $100 I bought this uh, Bosch & Lomb student microscope, which was my pride and joy. He spoke a little bit about his work and a lot about his sort of views of the state of science. Hearing from someone like him who is ready to take the bull by the horns and reform the system um, is just really uh, kind of restores my faith. I'm an editor of a journal, an open access journal called eLife, and we see no reason to limit the number of papers or even the number of pages that we will publish. And so our, our policy is that we're going to publish all the, all the excellent papers that we get. I think it's absolutely necessary for everyone to take a step back and get really a, like a broader perspective on how to ask questions and what's important and being able to see yourself in someone who has attained a Nobel Prize is invaluable. I had the great good fortune to uh, be admitted to the laboratory of Arthur Kornberg, one of the dominant biochemists of the, 20, of the late 20th century. I learned from Kornberg not only <laughs> really how to work hard to satisfy him, but, uh, but also, how, more importantly, how to how to look at a complicated problem and to take it apart piece, piece by piece, putting it back together in vitro to reconstitute a complex reaction. This was, for me, a, a, a really formative experience that I uh, attempted to replicate as my career developed. Ultimately, they started off as a postdoctoral fellow, a graduate student, just like ourselves. So getting to hear the, the small the small details that sometimes can be really impactful. I was left with more questions than he was able to answer. Surely a complex series of events like this would be catalyzed by enzymes, structural proteins, all kinds of things which at the time were completely unknown. So when I began my own career in 1976 at UC Berkeley, I uh, resolved to rely on a microorganism where one could use the traditional tools of genetics and biochemistry. And so today, with the Q&A, we went through a lot of what maybe I will go through later. I'm curious to um, get a response from you, being that you've achieved so much in your career, regarding how you dealt with adversity. I had, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was uh, in a lab of a very powerful individual. Basically, it was, you know, uh, his way or the highway. and. Um, uh, he could be really brutal. Um, and so I thought when I started as an independent faculty member, I just had to be tough like that. So, <laughs> but I quickly learned that it's just not in my personality. And so uh, I couldn't do that. So I had to adapt to, to my own personality and develop my own style, which was to operate just by enthusiasm. And if people can, can be encouraged to work harder because I'm enthusiastic about what they're doing, then, that, then, then it works. But that doesn't work for all, for all types. So you just have to develop your own style. You know, you can, you can read the, a bio or a profile on them, but once you get to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, you start getting little stories. 
You know, whenever you propose to kill a living being in a, in a place like Berkeley, it's going to engender some controversy. Indeed, there was some protesting about our work, uh, end the torture in the labs. <laughs> Yeast have feelings too. You can make a difference with small steps and with um, perseverance and really hard work, you can get there. And I think that Dr. Schechtman really showed that in his work. Uh, one of the great experiences of my life, Peter called me excitedly and I ran down to see uh, one of the following images. Well, this was, uh, this was very exciting, but again, it was sort of from a random mutagenesis. And so we thought, there, surely there are many more genes, we need a way of finding them. Uh, and we decided at that point that it would be necessary to have some kind of a genetic selection. So Peter guessed that these cells would become, would, would increase their uh, buoyant density. And this then allowed a very simple procedure to separate mutant cells from wild type cells on a density gradient. This is a, this is a biochemist's idea of a genetic selection. I learned that uh, today mainly to stick to your guns. Keeping our eye on the big picture. Sometimes it's good to take not one, ten steps back and reevaluate the situation. Over the next 18 months there was a, a rush to use this procedure over and over. He isolated uh, an additional 220 mutant, independent mutant alleles. With the availability of the genes cloned and sequenced, we could say that the process of secretion is highly evolutionarily conserved. And he showed that even, even through basic science, he can really make a, a huge impact on the clinic, even though he wasn't really looking to make an impact on the clinic. This conservation allowed the biotechnology industry to harness yeast as a source for a production. And now, uh, one third of the world's supply of insulin is uh, produced by secretion in yeast. Coming to hear him speak was sort of a way for me to get inspired. Um, to hear what happens behind uh, the laboratory doors. What the countless hours of frustration that went into the science and how you might not know what's important when you're started. A week after I got the call uh, about the Nobel Prize, I received an email from the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. And every year they ask laureates to donate something to the museum, a kind of an artifact from the past. So here you are, if you come to the museum, you can visit my microscope and the docent will tell you how I had to run away from home to get this. Thank you for your attention. It's inspiring. <laughs>